under fire. Scientists criticize a recent report linking red meat to cancer. You may have seen headlines saying bacon causes cancer. We'll see why experts say that's not the whole story. And visit the Nature Nook to see how a local museum is getting hands-on with agriculture. Plus, hear from both of Nebraska's U.S. Senators and Governor Pete Ricketts on government issues that affect you on the farm. It's all ahead here on NTV's Grow. We are nearing the end of harvest. Marilyn will have more in a moment, but we begin with the Keystone Pipeline. The president's decision shows the divide in agriculture on this controversial issue. Nebraska Farmers Union has been part of the coalition with Bold Nebraska opposing the project. Farmers Union says the president made the right decision for landowners and our soil and water. However, many farmers say a strong pipeline system is needed because agriculture depends on a stable energy market. We've heard from a number of farmers who say pipelines cross their ground with no problems. Nebraska Farm Bureau leaders have spoken in favor of the project. We'll continue to follow it and send it back to Maryland. A lot of Nebraska fields are looking a lot like this one. Harvest nearing an end. USDA says 75% of corn harvested last year. We were just over halfway at this point. Weather has been favorable outside of some rain. Here's an update on harvest from producers from all across the state. First, we'll head down to Red Cloud. A little bit to go yet, and we've caught a little moisture here the last couple weeks, and so it's loaded a little bit, but otherwise, it's gone pretty smooth. A few bumps in the road in the Gothenburg area. Just a little over halfway done. Mm -hmm. um, have had a few rain and equipment delays, but nothing we can't handle. And moving to Cambridge as high yields are making up for those low commodity prices. The harvest is going well. Uh, we've had very good dry land yields and irrigated yields. We're done, I guess, with all our dry land. Could use a couple more lanes, uh, rains there in, in August. Mm -hmm. uh, Would have really made even that much better, but uh, having a very good harvest. And over in the Indianola area, rains were an issue. Respectable. We had um, the rain kind of shut off about the last month of production, and so I think we probably gave up 10 bushel, mm -hmm. and it looked just wonderful, but it still looked good. And the uh, yield monitors still were very positive, and so we feel good about this year. And in Blue Hill, a sigh of relief. How'd harvest go for you? Are you still in it here? I just got a text from my dad about 30 seconds ago that said we're done. It was a, it was a challenging year. We... Uh, we're definitely still in a drought, mm -hmm. but um, I think overall our irrigated yields were better than expected. Also wrapping up in Scribner, where they're setting records. Well, we have finished up for last week. The beans were probably record yields all mm -hmm. across. Not uh, hardly any difference between irrigated and dry land. Even non-irrigated crops really came through in the Oconto area. Are having a great corn harvest. Yields are definitely above average. Uh, Soybeans were slightly above average. Our, our yields weren't quite as, as high as what I was hoping, but they were still all in all really good. Dry land, our non-irrigated crops were great. Mm -hmm. There's been some years we've harvested, say, 5, 10 bushel of corn. This year we've harvested a lot of 130 bushel dry land corn. And it's a year to remember in the Bartley area. It was great. Yeah. Uh, yields were phenomenal. I mean, we haven't had yields like that in years. Uh, managed to get through them, get through them fast, and we finished it up, finished up on Wednesday. The USDA report shows livestock producers have started to move cattle to graze on corn stalks following harvest. Sorghum harvest 70% complete, and all but a handful of soybeans have been harvested. Nationally, in the major corn states, harvest is 85% done. Many farmers call it an overreach, and many state senators decided to take a stand against the waters of the U.S. Here's NTV's Grow co-host, Steve White. Even though we're already doing the right thing, are we going to have to do a lot more paperwork? Farmers fear puddles, ponds, and ditches would be regulated if the EPA is allowed to implement the clean water rule. Senator Ben Sass says the policy known as WOTUS, Waters of the U.S., needs to go. The WOTUS days are numbered. I think this is 
ultimately going to go down, and I'm for an all-of-the-above legislative approach to get there. A vote to kill the rule failed, so the U.S. Senate came back and passed a resolution of disapproval. Now, that doesn't actually stop anything, but Senator Deb Fisher says it sends a message. That's important that the public understands that the majority of the United States Senate is opposed to the rules and regulations that have been put out. Environmental groups like the Natural Resources Defense Council say the Clean Water Act has eroded and that puts drinking water at risk. They say this is one more attempt by Republicans to kill a landmark rule that protects against pollution. But Senator Ben Sass says it's not the EPA's place to make the rules, saying that should be done by Congress not unelected bureaucrats that should be setting important agricultural and conservation policy. Now the issue goes to the House for a vote. Even if it passes, no one expects the president to approve it. Nebraska lawmakers say they're looking at other ways to stop a policy they say is bad for farmers, homeowners, and cities. While environmental groups say the majority of Americans support rules like this that prevent pollution. And Congressman Adrian Smith takes a stand on what he calls extremist groups like PETA and HSUS. Smith published a column saying we need to promote sound science and sensible policies. One example is the recommended new federal dietary guidelines. The committee suggesting Americans should eat less red meat. That was based on sustainability issues, not nutrition. Another was a federal prison decision to remove pork from the menu, only to bring it back after backlash. Smith said these decisions need to account for the care livestock producers take to raise their animals. You may see new options out at the gas station. Armed with a nearly $3 million grant, the state hopes to add 80 new blender pumps across Nebraska. The state will match the federal money. All said they hope to have $6 million to work with. Nebraska is the number two ethanol producer. We all know ethanol is produced here in Nebraska, but it may come as a surprise that a lot of urban leaders do support it. 16 members of the Congressional Black Caucus sent a letter to the head of EPA asking the government not to back down on the national goals for ethanol production. Congressmen say ethanol improves air quality. They say urban areas where many minorities live are especially affected by that air pollution. Another lawsuit over irrigation water hits the courts. Farmers in the Frenchman Cambridge Irrigation District filed a second lawsuit seeking damages for lost 2014 irrigation water. The state wanted to dismiss a similar lawsuit, and Frenchman Cambridge users are upset they did not receive their full water allocation and say they want to be compensated for that. Property taxes are too high. We hear that time and time again from our friends in the ag business. So NTV's Melissa Newman, she talked to some lawmakers and has more now. We do have to reform um, education funding, state funding for education. We have to do something there. Dissatisfaction with property taxes was a common theme between legislators at the Platt Institute Summit last week. It's very easy to compare taxes. Some senators saying that recent changes have impacted the agricultural community the most. If ag land prices up, certainly over a three-year average, it takes a while for those to come down. The burden of taxes on those people is extremely high. On November 12th, legislators will be discussing a resolution that would help continue the state's study on how an increase in state aid to schools could offset property taxes. Another solution they have been looking at is putting a state cap on property taxes, but one senator says that infringes on local government. Now, uh, that kind of ties the hands of local government. I'm a big local government person. I would like to see the local governments, the cities and the counties address their own issues. A 2013 study by the Nebraska legislature found that school districts levy nearly 60 percent of the total amount of property taxes collected. So if school funding were changed, the legislature would have to do some restructuring of the budget. We did in the state legislature appropriate 45 percent more for property tax relief. Um, so we're trying to address it through that mechanism. I think that the governor is going to have a different plan that we all need to work on. We also had a chance to talk to Governor Pete Ricketts, and here's his reaction. If you look at your property tax statement, depending on where you are, uh, education is approximately 60 to 75 percent of that property tax bill. That's why the Revenue Committee and the Education Committee have been meeting to talk about 
some of the ideas that might work along the lines of property tax relief by looking at education funding. Certainly there's some things we can do that we can do a better job of along those lines. And while there's no uh, specific ideas that I can share with you right now, we are looking to include that as part of what might be a property tax relief package for the next session. Okay. About agriculture in a museum. We have more on what the kids got to see coming up next.